Welcome to the Synthetic Futures Generative AI in Games event. My name is Benny Isambert and I will be moderating this panel today. We had a couple of interesting panels about creating stuff with Gen AI in games design and about Gen AI in audio too. But today we are going to talk about ethical and legal challenges in using generative AI in games. We will likely look back on 2022 as the year of generative you know, AI as image generating systems from OpenAI and Stability AI were released, starting a flood of incredible images on social media. And I won't speak today with you guys about ChatGPT, at least not here and not now. I mean, we heard too much about that. As we lurch to the digital future, guys, familiar tech industry challenges like copyright and social harm are emerging. And this is totally natural. This is the nature of human being. But more generative AI companies are building on top of a few popular AI models that they either pay for, but mostly get for free. Generative AI models have in common that they are trained using giant content data sets, often created unethically, but also illegally. Stable Diffusion, for example, is trained on more than 5 billion images or captions, all taken from the web. These models currently claim to operate under the fair use copyright philosophy, but this idea has not yet been validated in court. Legal challenges are coming, which will likely modify the landscape of generative AI in general and generative AI in games. Larger studios may see competitive advantage by building proprietary models built on proprietary content to which they have clear rights. And today we are going to discuss those important issues. And for this, I'm very happy to welcome Professor Hani Farid from University of California, Berkeley, and Matt Ferraro from Wilmer Hale Law Firm. Hello, Matthew and Farid. How are you today, guys? Good to see you, Manny. It's great to be here and talking about these important issues. Thank you. Hello, happy to be here. Yeah, thanks again, guys, for joining us. I mean, you are familiar faces for this for this community. Matthew, I think this is your third participation, and you, Hani, it's your second one, yes, if I'm not wrong. But since then, I think it would be very nice if you could, you know, shortly introduce yourselves uh, to this community and explain what you are working on and what is interesting according to you in this very big question, generative AI in games and ethics. Hani, you want to, to begin, maybe? Sure. My name is Hani Farid. I'm a professor here at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, by training, I'm an applied mathematician and computer scientist. And for the last two, two and a half decades, I have been working on developing computational and mathematical techniques that detect manipulated media. This is before deep fakes and generative AI. This is in the age, if you will, of cheap fakes and Photoshop. Something in this landscape has changed really dramatically in the last five years. This field that we live in that used to be very niche and very small has suddenly exploded. And this ability to distort and create um, text, image, audio, and video, whole cloth, has really changed the way we think about authenticating content. So we continue to be in the game of how do we authenticate digital media? And then along the way, over the last more than a decade, I've been thinking about how we mitigate online harms from child sexual abuse to terrorism to disinformation campaigns. And how do we make technology work more for us and a little bit less against us? Thanks for this, Matthew. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Ferraro. I'm an attorney at the law firm Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C. Uh, about myself, I would say that this is actually my second career. My first career was as an intel officer with the U.S. government before I went to law school. So I approach some of these issues from both sort of a national security frame and a business frame. Um, in my private practice, I help companies deal with what I've termed disinformation and deep fakes risk management. So that's a lot of the, the harms that Hani was talking about when they're targeting uh, private, uh, uh, private companies and also individuals. And also in this space, I follow a lot of the developments in law and policy, and I help companies that want to create ethical uh, AI do so in a legal and ethical way, hence we're at this panel. Thank you very much for these guys. Um, let's let's start it, you know, with the, the question, the one, I don't know, million of something question. Is there an ethical issue in generative AI? And let's define maybe what is ethics, according to you, honey, and according to you, Matthew. Who wants to begin? 
I'm let Matt starts. I'm curious. Uh, I'd like to hear some from also from the legal side, and then I'll fill in from my side as well. And it gives me time to think, by the way. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you're the ethicist. I feel like I'm going to. Uh... <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give I'll be brief uh, so we can hear from the actual pro. Um, so I think that there are huge ethical issues around around AI in general, uh, and that in some ways, the, the profound question is, what does it mean to respect human dignity in a world in which increasingly complex tasks can be done by machines? Like, I think that is sort of the, the er question. Uh, when it comes to things like specific applications, like gaming, I think the question is about the ethics of ownership and creation, who owns and who creates, uh, who, who owns what is created, and how is it created, and then what, what rules, what ethical rules govern the behavior in worlds, in sort of gaming worlds and other forms of software. Uh, and uh, my general point, when I think about this, my general frame of mind, is that the battle for ethical behavior in games and indeed in generative AI in, in general will be won more by product design than policy development, more, that, more by cultural norms than by uh, law enforcement. And if we can talk about why, I guess my, my general argument is that there's this huge delta between like nothing, like a, a Hobbesian world of Hall against all where there's no rules and like a very structured legal regime. And there's all this space in between that is uh, formed, uh, that is occupied rather by policies and by cultures and, and things like that. So I think I've given Hani enough time to think about a very thoughtful answer. So I'll pass it over to Hani. Yeah, that was a great answer. I mean, really great. I. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that I don't think ethics are absolute. Um, I think they're hard to define, but I also know unethical behavior when I see it. Um, I know, for example, that when you take a technology and you use it to create non-consensual sexual imagery and target it primarily towards women, that is unethical. I know that whether you're a state-sponsored actor or an individual or an organization, and you use generative AI to create a disinformation campaign to sow civil unrest or disrupt an election, that's unethical. And um, I think there is absolutely, given the power of visual imagery, a serious ethical question, and also, of course, a legal question, which I imagine we will be talking about. I want to emphasize, I, I agree, by the way, that I don't think that we can fully regulate our way out of this issue. First of all, we're a country of 350 million people. We're 5% of the world's population. We can't control what happens in 95% of the world. So this, I'm not saying there is no room for regulation or legislation or some guardrails, but I think also we need as a community to come together and have serious conversations. Individuals have to start thinking about their responsibility. So I think this is something that we all have to do. I'm going to add one last thing to this is that we should absolutely focus on the technology. We should talk about what are we doing in terms of developing technology? Should we develop this technology? If we do develop this technology, should we deploy it? If we deploy it, how do we put guardrails and so on and so forth? But we shouldn't ignore the fundamental aspect of capitalism. I would contend that a big part of this problem is not just the technology, but it's how capitalism is trying to monetize the technology. And our inability, at least in this country, the United States, to really put careful guardrails around capitalism as well. So I think that there is a broader issue here as well, is that people are trying to make a buck on this technology, not neutral, right? And when there's capitalism in the game, the rules change very fast, yeah? So I think that's another part of this conversation that we should have as well. But back to your question, Benny, yeah, there's an ethical question and it's a big whopping one too. This is not a minor issue. Um, that is facing us as individuals, societies, and democracy. I and mean, we have to we have to get this right. If you agree, could we define ethics as the way Friedrich Nietzsche did define it a, a little bit more than 100 years ago, when 150, when he said in his famous book Beyond Good and Evil, that ethics is not about good and bad. But it's about you know what is allowed in a social contract and what is forbidden for the common good. Where I want to lead you guys is to the following thing: killing is bad. According to our Judean Christian societies, killing is bad. It's written in the Ten Commandments. It's written in the American Constitution, 
And most of the democratic countries do not use the death penalty on a daily basis, I would say. Most of it. Yes, honey. Um, but if killing is bad, killing is forbidden in some societies, unless until the moment it is not. And for example, in the US, in those states that do allow death penalty, killing is allowed. I mean, the one that is pushing the button on the electric you know, chair is not violating any kind of law. And more than everything else, he is considered as ethical because he's fulfilling his mission or she is fulfilling his, her mission. A butcher, for a vegan you know, point of view, is a killer. I mean, killing is bad until the moment you kill animals for eating. So, my question for you guys will be the following. If killing is bad, what will happen to a generative AI model trying to kill people in the virtual world? Is that something that is ethical? Is it something good? Is it something bad? And I'm sorry to try to trick you because you understand that there is a trick here. Yeah. But that's where we want to go. It means that what is allowed and what is forbidden in 2023 when it comes to Gen I, and how can we guarantee that those fundamental principles will be kept and respected by the machines once we will lose control? Because it's going to happen. I'm going to give Matthew time to think now, so I'll uh, I'll take a first stab at this. <laughs> so first of all, I I think it's tricky to say that killing is good, bad, legal, illegal. I think. I think many people would say for self-defense purposes, let's put aside the death penalty because that is complicated. But for self-defense purposes, I think killing is okay. If somebody's coming at you with a knife, a gun, and is about to take your life, I think most people would agree that it is a reasonable response if you have no other um, out to take that person's life. So I don't, I don't think fundamentally killing is bad. Moments of war, right? We don't say killing is wrong or bad, or I mean, we may not be happy with it. So I think, I think it's a tricky issue. Um, also, I'm a vegetarian. Um, I think it's unethical to kill animals. On the other hand, I wear a leather jacket. So, you know, we're all we're all we're all full of inconsistencies in the way we think about these things. Having said all of that, I do think for a long time we have thought about this split in that there's the online world and the offline world. And we've thought about them separately. Right? We haven't thought about online harms the way we thought about offline harms. And so to your question, is it okay to, in a, God forbid, the metaverse ever comes to being, uh, we take a life, if you will, in the metaverse. Does that have the same moral, ethical, legal grounding as in the physical world? Now, I think most people would be like, well, of course not. It, it's, a, it's a digital thing. Who cares? I don't actually think it's that simple. Um, I actually think it's a little bit more complicated than that because I can tell you, um, I sit on a few advisory boards for some of the big tech companies dealing with content moderation. And people associate a huge, phenomenal part of their identity and their mental health and their well being with their digital footprint. So that when they are just as simple as being banned from TikTok, this is a serious issue for them that they've lost a part of their life. It's like a limb has been chopped off. So I don't think we can be quite so cavalier with that attitude between the, 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 the digital and the physical world. I think that but this is the right question we begin to the AI systems, these notions of ethical behavior, what is allowed and what is not allowed. And the last thing I'll say, and the answer is I don't know, but let me say that it's not trivial. So let me give you an example of this. Imagine... Uh, in a few years from now, the AI overlords have taken over the world and they're governing us and policing us. Yeah. And imagine we decide, you know, we're tired of people dying from cancer. Let's tell the AI systems to eliminate cancer from the planet. And the AI system says, no problem. And it kills all the human beings. That eliminates the cancer, right? So we have to be very careful when we define objective functions because AI systems don't have the common sense to say, well, when they say eliminate cancer, they mean and leave the human beings alive. But the AI system is saying, this, look, this is an easy objective function. I can eliminate cancer today, kill every living being on planet. So when we define objective functions, do not take a life in a virtual world, you have to ask about how are you going to get there? And that is a non-trivial thing with these very complex AI systems. So putting rules of the road 
And an AI system is very tricky because we don't know how the system will get to enforcing those rules. And there may be unintended consequences that we have to think very carefully about. Uh, all really great, great points. Uh, and I don't have an answer for this, Benny, but I have a couple of thoughts to help frame it. Uh, the first is intention and context. And this is something that both Hani and you, uh, Benny, said. And, and um, when Hani was describing uh, ethical norms, she talked a lot about what was intended. You, you know uh, that that sharing deepfake pornography is wrong because you're doing it against someone's will to embarrass someone. You know, disinformation campaign is wrong because you're trying to change someone's mind. That's that's intent. And so I think thinking about intent when it comes to um, these issues is key. Context as well, right? And that is that is right. Murder is allowed in war, for instance, and that is that is like widely recognized. Uh, basically throughout human history with only small exceptions. So thinking about these issues with intent and context in mind. Uh, the second issue I would point to is what's called natural law versus positive law. And generally speaking, natural law is the law that you don't, that you don't need to create, that exists just inherently. And that would be that like kill, killing absent those circumstances that I named is wrong, would be like classic. Positive law would be like insider trading law, laws that bar like insider trading. This is not this is not law ha handed down from Mount Sinai. This is law that was like created to, to further a very specific goal uh, of, of clean markets. So like that would be the difference. So as we think about building the systems, what you know, what what is the positive law and what is the natural law? Well, like the, the idea that AI shouldn't kill people randomly would be like derived from a concept of natural law you know, how AI interacts with, well, the extended metaphor, like the markets, like what it does to manipulate markets would be like positive law. The third point I'd point to is this question of, with regard to the question of someone's AI presence, is it murder? I think a better construct is property. I think you should think about, especially now, uh, software, I mean, is considered intellectual property. And so if you, if you um, take away someone's uh, the avatar or their ability to access the site. I think of that more as property law issue. And that's an area in which we have a, a well-developed body of law. And I think that also lowers the temperature, particularly now as we're in these early stages uh, of the technology development. And the final thing I'll point to is that these are uh, live questions and they point to how you build these, uh, these precepts into the AI itself. And the, Something that got a lot of traction online was when somebody asked ChatGPT if it was ever permissible to use a racial slur to save a million people. And the AI said it would never use a racial slur, even in that context. And I think as a human, we know that that's like simply not true, right? <laughs> like like that, that there has to be a hierarchy of arms here. And that just is not uh, on the same scale. But because the AI was abiding by rules that had been set by people, it didn't allow it. And, you know, it, it's one thing if it's if it's merely spouting off, if it's mere, mere rhetoric, that's all they have chat GPT is doing, it's just speaking. If chat GPT or its successor was ever given that sort of functionality, obviously you'd want to try to build it with the right rules uh, at the base, which is to say there are rules, but there are exceptions. But honestly, that's a little bit like what makes us human. And I suppose if machines were really able to do that, it would be sentient in a way that they simply aren't now. Before we jump uh, directly to the games, uh, and, and I will ask you a couple of questions about, you know, stuff done by NPCs, non-playing characters, which is really interesting today. The discussions, I mean, your, your answers do lead me to one of my philosophy classes 30 years ago. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, being, be, beginning to be old now, uh, where we were discussing, you know, actually morality or ethics according to Immanuel Kant that said that you owe the truth because the truth is the basis of law and you need to say truth all the time if not you are killing or destroying the law and the legal system and I remember one of my favorite poets and philosopher Charles Peggy the French one that was killed during the first world uh, war that said that Immanuel Kant had clean hand hands, sorry, but he had, he had no hands. So it means that truth is very interesting and you can train a model to act in a, per, in, in a, I would say, specific way, but the human sensibility to know where you need to distribute your ethics and to who you owe your ethics is another question. And I think personally, 
that we are very far from it, that you cannot train at the moment a model to be ethical. But that's another question that we will discuss. Guys, games, games, game, games, generative AI. I think that we there is no doubt about the fact that the games industry is maybe one of the most interesting when it comes to playgrounding with generative AI. This is made for it, if you think about that, both in terms of music, audio, folly, um, dialogue, speech, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, everything related to, to imagery and animation, that's clear. But there is something else. AI today is mainly represented in games in the form of an NPC, a non-playing character. And I don't know if you play, guys, but I do. I still play, although I was studying, you know, philosophy studying year, 30 years ago. I still play, you know, massively. And what I feel is that today most of the games are populated by NPCs. So you, you meet people that do not exist in reality. They just exist in games. They are trying to act in a very, I would say, specific way, but not only, they're also intelligent and they can adapt themselves to what you are going to say, what you are going to play, what you are going to do. A question here, both in terms of ethics and mathematics, because we need to train those models. What happens if an NPC is violating a fundamental law during a game? And let me give you an example. In the sandbox, for example, or any other metaverse, you can buy lands. Today, you can buy properties. If somebody, an NPC, is stealing from me this property, who I need to sue? Am I on? Um, who are we going to sue? Well, first thing, Benny, I can't give any legal advice. Uh, I'll, I'll say that at the front end. But, uh, you know, it, it does seem to me that sometimes we complicate the simple, which is to say, if you're using the sandbox, you are using it subject to a contract uh, in terms of service and the terms of use. And so if somebody is, um, if you've engaged in the transaction pursuant to that terms of use and you get the property, which is really ones and zeros, if you just get, you know, get, get, get property as represented by uh, ones and zeros, um, and then someone steals it from you, that's going to be a violation of the contract. So I think that would be where to go. And I would say on the NPCs, as, as I understand them, and I have to say, um, I don't I don't play much games these days. But uh, again, it's, it would just be, I mean, it's software, right? So it's, it's software that's acting within the realm and it's acting, I would think, pursuant to the terms of use of whoever created or created the system that's going to create these things. And so I would think it would, it would have to go back to those underlying terms. I mean, I suppose even... If, back when I was uh, a younger person playing video games, you always were interacting with the computer game if it was civilization and you were battling with the opposing side uh, or even the you know, grandmaster chess and you're, you're playing chess against the computer. That, that, is, I mean, that is acting in response to you and that is in fact a computer program, but is, it is following the rules of the system. And so if it is in fact acting in a way that is harmful or problematic, it would be you'd say, well, is it acting pursuant to these rules? And if it is, if it is, then uh, then my issue is with the game itself, the, the realm itself, which has these uh, terms that allow this use. And if it is not, then it is essentially a contract violation. Yeah, I think I think you got it right. I think there is there is a terms of service here that um, can clearly define the rules of the road, and then you have an enforcement question. How do you verify that the various players in the system are abiding by the rules? I will point out, by the way, that there is a physical correlate to this question, which is steroid use in, in games. I think Lance Armstrong. Um, and think about how in the sporting world, we want there to be a, a, a fair level playing field. People try to cheat, of course, but we have enforcement mechanisms. We drug test. We have mechanisms for verifying. Of course, people try to circumvent that. It's a little bit of a cat and mouse game. I think you have to get used to that. Obviously, in the digital world, it's a little bit more different than the physical world. In the physical world, we have more control over the system. But I think that this, I think there's a there's a there's a mechanism here. And I, by the way, I've always thought that there should be two types of games: those that allow steroids and those that don't. Um, I mean, if we want to, I mean. Putting aside the health issues and the moral hazard of saying you should take steroids, you know, maybe is the best way to do this is just allow that game to happen and see what happens and then allow the clean game. I mean, sometimes, 
you know, everybody wants to win. And if you put everybody into these very strict rules, people are going to cheat. But if you split that system to say, look, if you want to do that, well, then go compete in those games. Well, maybe that's a good way to fix this. So have different sets of, of games. Those no rules. Do whatever you want. And those where there are rules. That's interesting, actually. I mean, because, I mean, we, what, what we will create here, I mean, the question I was asking also, uh, Matthew and, and Hani before that is who, who is accountable for an NPC, you know, act? And the question of accountability in games is super important because you know how much people are involved in creating a game. Uh, but what if what will happen when an NPC will be created based on a train model that was trained by an algorithm that has no father uh, or no mother? Then the algorithm will be responsible uh, in front of what kind of court, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those questions have no answer at the moment. It's way too early. But the social contracts that do a bond us a, until today are going to have to be readapted or revamped based on those unanswered questions. And this is a good, I would say, transition to my next question to you guys. Also in France, Pops and Locke uh, in the, I would say, the English speaking world, other Indian philosophers for the Indian world when it comes to the social contract, let's not, I mean, assume that we have invented the concept of social contract in the West. It's something that does exist everywhere in every single human society, whether it's Western, whether it's Eastern, you have a social contract. The feeling we have today is that no matter what you see on streets, I mean, I think it's also a bad omen to see that those social contracts have been destroyed lately by some, I mean, I would say street uh, stuff. In Israel, lately, we have the same kind of issues. In the US, you have been also dealing with this social contract. And I'm not speaking about the EU and everything that is related there about this social contract. The question that I'm asking myself and you then is whether we need to recreate these social bounds that does regulate with no connotation with the law, but does regulate the way we interact in games also today in between human beings, but not only. Does the social yeah. contracts, does, sorry, does the contract, social contract has the right also to regulate how we operate in society, in a virtual world, and more especially in a game, when you have human beings and user-generated content as a form of an NPC, for example? I, I think this is a great question, and let me... I, I've been thinking a lot about this because I do agree that something in our physical world is starting to break down. The social contracts are breaking down. I think this has been happening for a while. I think COVID accelerated it. I think the partisanship, at least here in the U.S., has made it worse. Um, and I think we are starting to see a fundamental breakdown of our society and just basic common civility and decency among human beings. Um, I would argue that that lack of a social contract and decency and civility has its roots in the internet too. I mean, the way people talk to each other on the internet is unbelievable. By the way, I have a theory, and that theory is that the reason why that has been allowed is because you can't get punched in the face for saying something on the internet. Uh, and I'm convinced <laughs> if somebody could reach through the computer and punch you in the face, people would be much more careful about how they talk to other human beings. <laughs> Um, I like this idea of, of a haptic robotics that would reach out when you say something stupid on Twitter and just smack you upside the head. Um, I'd like to see somebody invent that. Um, I do think that, um, and I don't know if we can fix this because this has been the culture. The one thing I've learned is that when cultures get formed, whether they are in neighborhoods or cities or towns or organizations or departments at a university or companies, they are very, very hard to change. Um, and I'm concerned that the social contract is quite poisonous on social media, that this notion of I, th that social media and the internet is here to allow me to say anything I want, anytime I want it, with no consequences whatsoever. I mean, that's sort of the, the underlying um, ethos, if you will, of the internet. And it's awful. People say and do things that are just truly awful. Um, and more often than not, they affect women and people of underrepresented groups. And so we end up silencing voices. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is that People like Elon Musk are keen to talk about the First Amendment and the freedom of speech and that we have a right to be heard. But if you really want a diversity of viewpoints and a diversity of, of, of voices, you need rules of the road. 
You cannot have a town square for a public debate and say, well, there's no rules. Anybody can come here with the loudest speaker and they can drown everybody out. But that's what he wants. That's what Musk wants. But if you really want a diversity of views, I would argue you want rules of the road. You want a social contract. You want basic civility and decency so people feel like they can talk without somebody threatening to kill them every time they open their mouth. And so I think the social contract is critical. I think it is breaking down in, in society. It is largely broken down in the internet. And as we enter the next age of this, I think we have to think very carefully about how we want to interact with each other online. And I'm worried that we're simply going to take over the the awfulness that is social media today and map that into the next world. And I think that will be very bad for everybody. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I, I would say, I think that uh, the fear is that the, the biliousness of the social media world infects the next world and not like vice versa. And not like that, that the, that the sort of uh, implicit social contract and norms of understanding that we that we exist with just in our daily lives uh, that that doesn't somehow translate into make the next world better it somehow it just gets worse i think that's one concern the other thing i would say it came to me as honey was speaking is that this does come down to a bit of product design and i'll give you two polls to think about this one is twitter in the sort of no rules era even you know now but even before now like 2015 right that's one poll and 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 because the product prize, virality, fo followers, um, all of that stuff, it incentivized a certain kind of activity, right? Compare that to Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia is another product, but it, it, it's designed to value other things, right? It values reliability, um, validity, you know, it, it, it uh, ups editors who are well-respected, in the system and what you have with wikipedia is a very reliable encyclopedia not perfect but i mean just sort of a polar opposite from something like twitter and so i think when we think about social contract uh, again it's it's an issue more of norms than of laws it, i think it was steve bannon who said that law is downstream of culture uh i think that's what he said and so it's, it's the same issue really here i mean i think if we design the products to embody certain incentives and certain norms that will result in a certain kind of world. Uh, and if we do it another way, it will result in a far worse world. Can I follow up on something Matthew said? Because I think he is 100% right that this is actually a design issue. And I would take it even one step further is that it's a business model issue. That we built the modern internet with a very specific business model. Ad-driven revenue is the dominant business model on the internet. By the way, why? Because 20 years ago, nobody thought you could make money on the internet. When Google and Facebook started, everybody thought, this is ridiculous. You're giving away everything for free. How are you possibly going to make money? Nobody wanted to put their credit card um, into a website. And obviously, that has changed in a very fundamental way. But our business model has remained the same. And if you are in the business of delivering ads, you are in the business of driving engagement. And if you are in the business of driving engagement, you are in the business of outraging people because that's what keeps us coming back more and more and more. So I would love for us now, 20 years into it, to fundamentally start rethinking this business model, the surveillance capitalism, as they call it. Because I would argue that is probably, and I think Matthew is exactly right here, is the core poison that is social media today, is that the incentives are simply misaligned. Yeah, 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 you are totally right, both of you, by the way. It reminds me, you know, also the, the, the discussions and words have a meaning, and we forget in general that words have a meaning. And, you know, people that do feel that they have the liberty to do whatever they want to do, they misunderstand the concept of license, of doing something, and the concept of freedom. And this is also a huge problem in our societies where, you know, the young generation think that they can do whatever they want to do without respecting any kind of rules, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not, you know, the way life has been organized for the last at least, you know, 8,000 years that we know that we exist on this, on this earth. But more than everything else, also the question that is underlying what you are saying is whether, you know, human being, the human is born good and the society is turning it, him or her, into bad, meaning Rousseau, again, or are we more on the Voltaire side saying that the human being has been born, you know, he's been born bad and the society is fixing him, 
or her. And this is exactly where we are today. Again, three, almost 300 years after they wrote what they wrote, we still do not have any kind of answer to these kind of things. And a social contract, as far as I'm concerned, as I'm a humble you know, philosopher of sciences, is something that must be dynamic. It, it cannot be carved in stone because society is dynamic. And then if your social contract becomes a kind of Bible, a kind of canon, then we have a problem because it becomes to be holy and you cannot move one millimeter from this social contract. And then you miss the whole point of adapting yourself to the way we are using today life and societies. But more than everything else, and, and before I put a dot on this subject of the social contract, I think that the social contract doesn't need to, doesn't need to have revamped. It is revamping itself, whether we want it or not. The question is, are we willing as professionals to push into this dynamism some of our ethical principles, or are we willing, like you said, to stay you know, on the side until the moment that we will stop doing money on top of it? So this is again the war spiel, and this is very old. This is the modern and the and the antiques, you know, battle uh, of you know years that we we still don't do not have the capacity to solve. Guys, two two last questions before we we wrap it up. A very very common question. Yes, no. If you want to expand your answer, I would be very very happy. At metaphysic.ai, where I'm leading, you know, research and ethics, we don't believe that technology is neutral. We don't believe at all that technology must be permissionless and technology must be open sourced in a certain extent. Some of the components of a technology, yes, but we don't believe that tech is neutral. What is your take on this? Is tech neutral? It is, of course, it's not neutral. And I know people will disagree with me, but, it, but it's clearly not. And I think it's convenient to say the technology is neutral. Um, it's a little bit like saying guns don't kill people, people kill people. You really want to get in bed with the NRA? Oh, man, that's going to get me in trouble. Um, but I do think fundamentally, this has been part of the ethos of the technology sector, is that technology wants to be free. Technology wants to be open source. Technology is neutral. And that has led to a phenomenal 20, 30 years of innovation. But the game is up. We have to stop pretending that we're not seeing harms from these technologies. And we have to start thinking more carefully, not just about if how we should develop a technology, but even if we should develop a technology. And if we do it, how do we deploy it? How do we deploy it safely? And we have to stop this mindset of beta testing on the public, right? This is very much in the ethos of computer science. As you develop this product, it doesn't really work very well. And you're like, well, I'll just put it out there and see what happens. And then you start beta testing it on people. There is nothing in the physical world. You be, can you imagine getting on an airplane being like, well, we've never really tested this plane, but we think if we load it up with a bunch of passengers and get to 30,000 feet, eh, we'll figure it out once we're up there. That's insane. So I think we have to start thinking more carefully. And by the way, I hate to talk about ChatGPT because too much has been said about it, but this is what Microsoft did. They unleashed ChatGPT way before they were ready to do it. Why? Because they were excited about the... Uh, monetary gain there. So I think we have to start changing the fundamentally the way we think about these technologies. And I think the question to me is clear, technology is clearly not neutral. I, I think it's some like um, platonic ideal. I have to imagine, I had to mention a philosopher, Benny, I had to think of someone. Uh, in a platonic ideal, it might be like neutral, but in the way in which, for every reason that Hani said, um, the way that you design it is going to have certain incentives. And again, it just gets back to what we were talking about before about, about product design that, um, and maybe a gun is a good analogy. Uh, sure, I suppose in some basic sense, a, a, a gun is agnostic, but if you make it uh, really rapid fire and you fit it with an extended clip and you make it um, easy to hide in a jacket, it's going to have very specific externalities. Uh, and I think the same might be true with, with certain kinds of tech, to not draw the analogy too far. Um, but no, I, so I, so I think you have to think about this as, as design. Um, and I do think that one positive, since we did mention chatbots, of like chatbots and all that coming to the fore is it really raises uh, the conspicuousness of these technologies in the public eye. And it might be a good time now to build those guardrails that are both legal and social and cultural and product. Now, before the technology is uh, integrated into every facet of human society and, and commerce. Like I think that this actually, 
it's helpful to see in some in some extent like the future we might behold if we don't think more critically about these these issues now yeah let's uh let's stop moving fast and breaking things we tried that for 20 years it, it doesn't work it's a really dumb motto let's let's do better so, so honey i have to say that, that this is so funny because this is exactly the phrase that i use when i talk to clients now in the gen ai yep. space as i say i say like we're, you're moving fast and breaking things, which means you're breaking things. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, you have to put the emphasis on yeah, the last part, yeah. not the first part. Right. <laughs> and so it's only a matter of time until litigations come, state regulators come, uh, European yeah. regulators. So like yeah. you have to think about what it is that you're breaking. Um, so anyway, let's not repeat history. We tried this once. We know how it's going to end. We have we have the benefit of hindsight yeah. here. <laughs> That's very true. L last questions. Uh, and thank you again for being with us today with the Synthetic Futures community. Um, one effect, I would say, that the generative AI disrupting is creating, I'm not calling it a revolution because I don't believe in a revolution, um, is mainly lowering as much as possible the cost of producing a game, for example. A, it took something like between five to six years to Sony to a uh, produce and release God of War Walk, a, a, the, the, their last games. Today you can do with generative AI, not maybe the same quality, but little studios with two or three designers are able to create you know, voices with synthetic media, visuals with synthetic media, voice, audio, foley, et cetera, et cetera. It means that you know, this very little community of game developers or game studios is going to be wider and wider and wider with no legal departments, with no advisory boards coming from the science world, et cetera, et cetera. As professionals, both of you, what would what will you recommend to a game creator or a studio before using generative AI in their design? And I think that they, I know the answer. I mean, design, 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 product, product, product. But if you can elaborate a little bit, how would you like your maybe client uh, on your side, you know, Matthew, or maybe your student on your side, honey? what he or she needs to do before using generative AI in games. And that would be my last question for today. I'll just go first. I'll say um, this is going to sound somewhat self-serving, but I think you really do need to talk to your lawyers be because this is just a very fraught space. And uh, the day that we're speaking, I'm going to have a piece coming out later today that goes to the top 10 legal and business risks of, of, of chatbots and generative AI based on the the news recently and it's like we were i had to stop it at 10 because we just <laughs> like we're coming up with too many risks and um and there's there's data privacy risk there's discrimination risk there's contract risk there's um deceptive trade practice which is an issue in states across the, the u.s and so there are all these issues and so i i think that i you still want to encourage innovation but it, it can't be heedless like you have to think about the technology, if you're using third-party um, AI, read those terms of service, right? And if, if, I mean, like, you, better if you have a, your lawyer read them, but if you don't have a lawyer, you've got eyes, read it yourself, make sure that it's consistent. If you're in a position uh, to negotiate with a third with the third-party creator of the AI model, uh, seek indemnity, if you can, against, you know, bad actions that might occur. Uh, if you're developing it yourself, think about all these issues uh, when it comes to things like the, the rights holders, because you're training your model, it's there's lots of IP intellectual property issues, but there's it, it comes in kind of three flavors. One is the, the data that's fed into the model, right? Like who owns that? The other is the, the, the information that comes out of the model, who owns that? And then the third is if the model creates it totally uh, on its own, right? So if there's not any kind of human interaction, uh, is that in fact copyrightable? Uh, and it's, it, this is a very current issue right now. So like, you got to think about those issues. So it, it's all to say that I think that innovation is great. Obviously, uh, it's really great to be thought to, to be creative. And I think we want to welcome all of that. But you just have to be thoughtful. Uh, because if not, uh, it's you're going to find yourself perhaps in some trouble on the back end. I'm in the second what Matthew said is you got to talk to a lawyer. No kidding. Um, I mean, I think what I preach to students, and I get these emails many times a week of students very excited about technology and AI and wanting to go out and be an entrepreneur. And I think that's great. And we should, we should encourage that. But you have to have a certain amount of humility, knowing what you don't know, 
And the thing with the lawyers, and look, it's easy to make fun of lawyers. I don't, I, I think that that, but it's easy to make fun of, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> but the reality is that, you know, the good lawyers, the good firms are there to protect you and to protect everybody. And they will, and we should have those conversations. Um, I think humility is important um, to know what you know and know what you don't know. Um, I will also say there are some real uh, landmines here that we have to tread very carefully with. Let me give you one example of this, where I was talking to a, a startup about this who wanted to bring generative AI into social media. And I pointed out to them that while Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act protects you, protects you from third party content, it does not protect you from content that your AI system creates. And this is a really interesting minefield for, for tech companies now, that this, this wide, phenomenal law that has protected tech companies from almost every imaginable lawsuit suddenly goes away when it's your generative AI bot that is creating the content that you are then distributing. You don't have protection for that, and you have to think very carefully about these things. Um, I also think that there are known harms and unknown harms. And I think what happens with tech companies is the obvious thing, which is that they're moving fast. They're trying to get a product out. They've got competition. And the safety comes as a secondary tertiary idea. Um, there is a, 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 a movement called safety by design that you build it in at the very beginning of your thinking. How are people going to misuse this? Not, I was just talking to a group of young students the other day who had this very idealistic view of a new version of social media. And I'm like, guys, this is going to get abused left, right, up, down. I mean, it's just, you have to build these precautions in. You have to understand that this is an adversarial system. There are bad people out there who want to do bad things. And you have to design the safety from the very beginning. You can't backfill these things the way we have been doing for the last 20 years. I just had one quick thing, which is that um, a lot of law firms, including mine, although this isn't an advertisement for me, uh, they do have programs for startups, like legit startups that are pre pre-funding of any kind. And so if you do have a great idea and you want to create a company, like you, you can look and see and you can usually get a half hour, an hour's time of a lawyer to just talk through these issues or maybe come in through their startup program. So so anyway, I just I just say that to say that le legal uh, guidance is available and not usually out of reach if you know where to look. Landed, I mean, we have covered a lot. I would say during this little hour that we were together, I feel, but that's again, me being old, that we, we could turn, you know, what was said here into, I would say, a curriculum a, for a university course or a book about ethics a, with Gen I, maybe, maybe at one point. And I would like to, before I thank you and, and thank the community, to give you a little quote from my favorite, obviously, philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, very relevant today, by the way. Uh, that said that, you know, you cannot blame the mirror for the reflect, it is reflecting. And I think that on my side, that would be my main recommendation to a game creator. Create a technology, a software that you are proud of, and that will be controllable by you and you only. Because you won't be able to blame a, I would say, the technology for the harm that it could create at one point. And this thing was written 150 years ago, no computer, barely, you know, trains, et cetera, et cetera. And it's still relevant today, even more than, than uh, any days else. Guys, uh, Honey and Matthew, I would like to thank you for this incredible talk. I was very, very happy to host you during, you know, this panel. We will meet again uh, within the Synthetic Futures community. I'm certain of it. And meanwhile, uh, thank you and have a good day. Thanks so much, thank you, Honey. Bye-bye.